Tommy, welcome to the stage. Mr. Kenneth White, uh, he is director on the board of the Open Crypto Project, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is one of the gentlemen that's doing a lot of good work to try and uh, help us understand how things are not safe enough yet, but are safe yet. And uh, uh, I've been following and talking to him on Twitter and, and watching this project since it all kicked off. Thanks. Appreciate the uh, kind words, Ben. And uh, I just want to say that folks have really been uh, been really gracious hosts, so I appreciate that. <coughs> So here are a couple of things I want to talk about uh, this morning. I don't have any sort of really deep, uh, you know, thoughts and insights. This is more just sort of sharing some things that have happened over the last year or two, and and uh, maybe giving uh, some technical insights on on some of the work that we're doing. Um, so I hope it's I hope it's useful. Um, this is me. So I'm Ken White on Twitter. I uh, try not to yell or rant too much, but occasionally I'll get on a, a good mini rant. Um, slides at uh, at Speaker Deck if you're interested. Um, and as Ben mentioned, um, and I'll talk about it in just a second, one of the projects I've been working on for, um, I guess, almost two years now is the Open Crypto Audit Project. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting effort, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a, uh, now. So um, <clears throat> I think most of the people in the room probably know about the True Crypt Audit, but in case you're not familiar, it was a uh, community-funded and, and sort of uh, global initiative to do a proper formal crypt analysis of the uh, TrueCrypt software. Um, we had no idea when, when we started it how sort of, <laughs> you know, uh, how much support around the world we were going to get. And so we ended up actually forming a nonprofit foundation uh, or a nonprofit organization. We were still seeking uh, 501c3 status, which if you've ever dealt with the, uh, the IRS on nonprofits, it can be a, a painful and arduous uh, uh, path. Um, I really encourage you to take a look at the site. We've got an incredible advisory board. Um, some of the top people in academic crypto, um, in applied crypto, uh, legal and privacy experts. Um, it's, it's a tremendous group. Um, but but so we uh, you know we wrapped up the work uh, about a month or so ago on TrueCrypt, and uh, you know all of our audit information is is online, and, and encourage you guys to take a look. Um, Around the time that uh, Heartbleed broke out, the uh, Linux Foundation approached us and said, you know, um, we're putting this thing together called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And, uh, you know, sort of explained a little bit about that and said, we'd really like the uh, Open Crypto Audit Project to audit OpenSSL. So, um, so we'll talk about that in just a bit, what's involved. But it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly ambitious project. It's probably one of the most uh, ambitious security projects in the history of, uh, of recent history in the internet. So let's talk a little bit about the security uh, trust chain. So we're about a year post Heartbleed. Um, <coughs> I've got some links later on, but the the Verizon uh, data breach investigation report, which is a fantastic resource if you're not familiar with it, um, put out some some interesting numbers. But one of the things that that I really want to you know make sure people understand is that. Most of the vulnerabilities that were serious um, ha have very little to do with crypto. They're, they're basic software implementation problems. That said, as we saw about a month ago with uh, Logjam, there are some fundamental problems with existing protocols on the on the internet. It's certainly true with Poodle. I mean, you know, when you're in an IT organization supporting enterprise customers on a you know on a you know global basis. It's a. It's not trivial to say just disable SSL three. I mean, the amount of legacy, um, you know, interdependencies and things is just staggering. Um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But one of the points I want to make is that as we started looking at OpenSSL and and some of the other sort of core pieces of the, uh, I guess the, the internet core stack, if you will, particularly on the Linux side, but this is true on Windows as well. There are some fundamentally crucial pieces of that stack that are 15, 20 years old that no one's looked at in a serious and disciplined way. 
And even if you use Linux every day, I'm going to show you some things that will probably blow your mind in terms of you know what's uh, what's out there on you know, public facing servers. So this crucially, um, I've been using Linux since I don't know the 90s. I mean, you know, I had the little disk when Red Hat, you know, the the second edition came out that you can send in, uh, you know, a few bucks and actually get the 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 open source version, not the not the enterprise. Um, and uh, you, you know, I use Bash every day. I've done you know fairly large scale global deployments with you know a, a Linux stack. And there are things that we've seen in the last year or two that are just you know mind blowing. So just a couple questions. So how well do you know the network stack you deployed um, for people that are, are on that side of the house? I um, mean, how about your technical staff? And do you think you really understand the core dependencies? Do you really? Are you sure? So I had an interesting conversation with uh, a guy in DC about two months ago or so. And he asked what I did. And I was sort of explaining some of the projects with, uh, uh, you know, that I'm involved in. And I sort of got this vibe that, you know, he didn't, he wasn't sort of a, he didn't consider open source uh, software or Linux, Linux systems like enterprise ready. <laughs> you know, I think, I think he sort of focused on a lot of Microsoft proprietary products and a lot of like, you know, really large scale, you know, big iron kind of, you know, network gear. And, and so, you know, I said, well, in the work that you do, you know, you have public facing systems. Yeah, sure. And do you have you know, databases? You have VPNs? Yeah, of course. Well, what are you like personally responsible for? And it was something in the order of like 200 different um, mission databases, um, and they were SQL Server. And I said, well, when you administer them, use a VPN. Yeah. But he's like, no, that open source stuff. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, well, we use Cisco. Okay. Well, bring up Cisco on your phone. You're running open SSL. Look closer. You're running libcurl. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't have to. I, you know, I think the people in this room follow the, you know, published vulnerabilities. You know, enough to know that any given week, um, whether it's a, an open source project or proprietary, you know, gear, uh, things come out. It is a little surprising when a company the size of Cisco has hard coded SSH keys that an attacker could run arbitrary code as the root user, yeah, you know. <laughs> so um, when, when Shellshock came out, I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the media just gets this wrong. I've seen, uh, you know, even, even like top five mainstream media sites literally take screenshots from Twitter of uh, satirical accounts, you, you know, satire, like, like there's a, what is it, Pope Hat has this uh, sort of fake, you know, North Korean government uh, Twitter. Th if you read even two minutes of it, you know, it's it's obvious that it's an absurd satire. But I've seen that like bubble to the top of the news feed, like you know, breaking news: North Korea is doing X or Y. Um, and so, it's not really surprising, I guess, sometimes when you see that 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 a lot of the technical details were kind of missed, even even in the tech media. But the reason a lot of people really um, you know, stood up and noticed with Heartbleed and with, you know, Shellshock, you got a $100,000 F5 big iron load balancer. I changed the name of my browser from Firefox or Chrome or whatever to user agent, and you see it there. I can run arbitrary commands because of an environmental variable that's inherited through a process, which eventually goes to bash, which can be overran, blah, 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 blah. What? So. Um, you know, these were some of the things that were sort of brewing when the, um, the core infrastructure initiative started and then as it, you know, as it sort of uh, moved forward. Um, but let's take a look, a really close look at the whole security trust chain. So if, if you deal with, um, you know, web-facing systems, I, I'm guessing that, you know, if you're a, sort of a hands-on engineer, you maybe, you know, we sort of... The conventional wisdom is, well, you limit the attack surface, you, you turn off unneeded uh, services, you, um, you, know, you don't install unnecessary executables, you, know, you, you basically make the attack surface as small as possible. But, but one of the things I've discovered <laughs> last year and a half working with some of these systems is that there's an incredible amount of complexity just to get through the init process, 
right? So, so what is one of the first things that a machine does when you when you bring it up? It does discovery. It does, uh, you know, it, it does advertisement in the IP or DCP. So at the very earliest levels, what is one of the things that's happening? Well, you need to identify the machine, and you may need to identify the you know the um, FQDN that your your network is sitting on. Well, that's not necessarily ASCII, uh, right? I mean, so the moment we allow non-Latin characters, and then we go all the way into Unicode, well, now we need internationalization libraries in the init boot process of Linux. I, I can tell you how many people in this room have ever heard of libidn before. Right. It, it's You can't even bring up the, the, the Ethernet stack on modern Linux is without doing that because it's part of the name. Uh, compression, we know that, you know, libz is, is everywhere. If you deal with the crypto side of things, you know that, you know, certificates are crucial. Um, but then, you know, if you look at sort of the bigger enterprise middleware, like, um, you know, a lot of the uh, CRMs and uh, HR systems and things, you know, the, the core Java um, crypto library is called Bouncy Castle. Well, there's also the other web frameworks around, Spring, Struts, etc. Well, libbfd, how many people have heard of that? People know about curl, right? I mean, you know, it's a real useful utility and things, but libcurl is actually a core piece of, of some of these things as well. So how many people have used uh, one of these utilities, cat, less, or more, on Linux by show of hands, right? Everyone uses this, you know, strings. How many of you used strings before, right? Don't do that. Don't do that without doing dash A. Why? Because there's a 15-year bug, which in some distros has been fixed, in others they quibble with whether it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, a true vulnerability or a feature. But so libbfd, it's a, it's a core utility that's in the bin utils, it's been around forever, that helps identify the type of file that you're looking at. <coughs> so I, I don't know if this, folks in the back can see this, but um, <coughs> one of Google's like best security engineers, he goes by the handle of uh, uh, Elkham Tough um, on Twitter, has put together a utility that's, well, it's, it's actually a whole series of tools that's fantastic called the American Fuzzy Lob or AFL, it's gone in, and what it does is, I, I'm sure people are familiar with fuzzing in general, but <clears throat> one of the problems with fuzzing, so you have a form or you have some other kind of uh, input that it, the user's supplying, and what fuzzers do is they say, you know, the old joke is, well, uh, you know, a Linux QA engineer walks into a bar, he orders a beer, he orders nine beers, he orders negative one beers, he orders a, you know, an uncle, he orders, you know, zero, he orders null, he orders, et cetera. So, so the, these are some of the, the ways that people traditionally think you, you sort of feed you know, weird characters in. But, but what this does is it actually uses AI. It actually uses machine learning to like figure out what the most logical paths or, or the most likely vulnerable paths are in, in executables. Because remember, attackers don't attack the source. They attack what's actually been compiled, the, the actual executable. So in this case with BFD, <laughs> Attacker supplied input in the file can write arbitrary, you know, uh, um, run arbitrary commands. What? Hey, it gets better. So, I, by by show of hands earlier, less, more, yeah. Did you know less is actually a script? It's actually a shell script on many Linux distributions. What? What? Yeah, um, and. Note the date here, 2005. This was an issue back then. <laughs> um, and I had to verify this myself. So I spun up a brand new you know, instance on, on Amazon Linux and you know, did all the patches and updates and things. Yeah, depending on your environment variable, there's this program called lesspipe.sh. It's a bash script. Depending on if these environment variables exist or not, when you run less, you're actually running that. So again, let's say you're doing forensics. Let's say you're doing very simple, basic, um, you know, breach analysis, and you've got some files, and you know maybe there's a a fair amount of of, of uh, exfiltration data 
that you're looking at, so you run strings on it. Without some of those special parameters, an attacker could have alphabetically coded or numerically coded, so it's high in the, in the list, um, a thing that runs arbitrary code by running less. Wow. So, yeah. But this is my point. N not that there's some particular bug somewhere or that that's, you know, this particular library is good or bad. That's not the point. The point is that most Linux admins haven't even heard of it. So, libcurl. How many people know curl by show of hands? All right. So libcurl is just the sort of C wrapper that's, you know, platform portable. Um, so, by show of hands, uh, curl runs and understands HTTP, yes? SSL, yes? Keep going. It speaks LDAP. Did you know that? I did not know that. It speaks POP3. It speaks IMAP. And until about a year ago, it spoke Gopher. So, so, so curl is an incredibly useful tool. Libcurl wraps that, brings it into libraries that are used by fundamental pieces of the Linux stack. What? All right, well, let's go higher up. And by the way, I don't have it here, but I've got some great examples. Whenever you see an exploit on the Microsoft side that says, and this affects every version of Windows or every version of IE, it's the same thing, you know, back to 95. I've seen two or three of those in the last year. So it's, this is not, an, uh, you know, by any means an, an, a, you know, an affront against uh, open source. Um, I'm not talking about a complicated global CDN with geocaching and, you know, and, you know, complex BGP smart routing and things. You just want to put one box that's SSL enabled that's sort of basically a glorified pamphlet, right? That, that's a solved problem, right? Well, that was White House Gov as of about two weeks ago. It's been fixed. But the, the point is that, like, this is, this is a basic misconfiguration. Um, I think, and then also, there's been a lot of, if you follow the crypto world, there's been a lot of talk about collisions with uh, MD5 and, and SHA-1 with um, uh, sort of known uh, pretext attacks and things. And I think a lot of people kind of dismiss some of those as purely academic. Um, they're not. <clears throat> so look closely at that. Two different images are hashing the exact same way. I did not know that was possible. Network transport. Um, I don't know if people followed my rant and then there was a sort of bigger stories about uh, some of the mobile carriers, but if you have, um, you know, AT&T or Verizon up until about two months ago, um, and this was true for enterprise customers too, not just, not just consumer, um, if you uh, traverse on your mobile or iPad or whatever, uh, over those networks, there was injection and alteration of the actual text. Uh, like, you know, people have heard about JavaScript, you know, like at portals, like at, you know, coffee shops and things where there's, you know, maybe ads inserted or, or on, on flight, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, where there's like a, you know, frame bar or something put in. And, and that's sort of annoying, but you sort of figure, well, it's, it's kind of spammy and it's sort of, you know, it's kind of in their their world, but I'm talking about the actual network transport on an access point, or on a corporate iPhone, or on a corporate um, you know iPad, or Android. So I had to test this myself. So so literally just telnetting. There's you know there's nothing at my sleeves. I'm telnetting. I'm saying, go get the index page at this website. The carrier is injecting. A tracking ID in there. What? So, uh, if people are interested, I, there's a whole talk I could give on on that. But there's some interesting resources on Wired and on uh, ProPublica that did this. And at first, it was sort of, well, you can opt out. And then the responses by the two carriers were like, well, it, it, we were just experimenting. But I set up a website, and in the side of in the maybe three weeks or so, I got over a million hits. Um, the vast majority of North American traffic was getting these, and the best part of it is that they persisted, so you couldn't opt out. It didn't matter what your browser was setting for don't track or what you know cookie things you had in or whatever. Some people refer to this as a super cookie, but the point is the fundamental network transport didn't have 
you know, wasn't, you know, keeping my data you know, intact as sent. That's an issue. Um, if you followed some of the discussions in the last couple months, if you use a commercial VPN service, they pretty much all suck, and they pretty much all lie, and they pretty much all deny that they suck and that they lie, but here you go. Here's like, I don't know, 15 of the top uh, VPNs. This is their pre-shared key. This is their pre-shared key from links from their docs and from their support forums and things. So sometimes I'll say, well, that's, uh, it, it's only a theoretical attack. This is the equivalent of putting your certificates private keys, you know, on a, on a public FTP site. The, the, in an IPsec VPN, pre-shared keys are used as an authentication mechanism to know that you're actually talking to the other person. They're supposed to be secret. These are published. And they're not even clever, you know, like, like it's the IP vanish and their pre-shared secret key is IP vanish. Right. Um, <coughs> Some of the stuff that came out of the, the logjam analysis with issues with the downgrade attacks on, uh, on crypto, you know, we're not even getting there. This is, this is just giving it away. Um, I found maybe one or two decent private services, but even then, uh, they're only decent because they're, what they do is qualifying, you know, what they should be used for. Sort of, well, if you just want to prevent snoopers at a Wi-Fi cafe or at a, you know, a hotel, uh, you know, public Wi-Fi spot, it's fine, but if you're, you know, concerned about, you know, tracking or, or ads or things like that, it's probably not the best use. Right, because VPNs don't provide anonymity, and they don't really provide privacy. I, I mean, if you're on a corporate VPN that does point-to-point -point with no internet access, fine, but um, if you really want privacy and anonymity, use the Tor bundle. They've gone to a lot of pain to, like, you know, Keep um, uh, some of the the really clever tracking tools out, uh, technologies out. Um, ad networks. I don't know how. It seems like every month it goes by one of these major media sites. This is not some, you know, you know. I can has cheeseburger site. This is Forbes. This is Fortune. This is CNN. This is the New York Times. This is Washington Post. And and often what you see behind this is well, first is the political discussion about. You know, the Syrian electronic army, whatever that is, and then attribution. But I think it misses the point. When you see these ad network hacks, what, what happens is the, the, these major properties, these major web properties, have lost control of their DNS. That's a big deal. I mean, they're not sophisticated hacks. A lot of times they're social engineering, a lot of times they're simple email resets. That's not the point. They've lost control of their DNS. Any uh, IBM? Or Lenovo users in here? You remember this one? Bank of America, HTTPS bankofamerica.com, issued by Superfish. Thanks. That was that was excellent. PrivDog. Excellent. And what what got missed in a lot of the narrative about the Lenovo thing is that if you're a reasonably mature shop, you know that if it doesn't matter where you get your, your notebooks from, HP, Dell, whatever. You do a clean wipe on a known image, you install your pieces, maybe modify some of the certificates, you know, put whatever you need on there, and that's fine. But that's not how the vast majority of consumers deal with things, and, it's, and that's not how most doctor's offices and attorneys and CPAs and accountants and dentists and, you know, your cousin <laughs> does that. What they do, maybe if they're a little bit tech savvy, is they go in and they do the decrapifier, where they sort of get rid of all the trialware and the you know the 30-day Hallmark card creator generator thing and the you know the McAfee thing that's outdated. What got missed in the story with uh, Superfish was even if you did that, the fundamental operating system root store had been modified, so you were still getting man in the middle when you went to Bank of America or whatever site, in real time, certificates are being generated, presented as that. Uh, Microsoft did one of the more unusual things. Um, they actually sort of invoked the nuclear option. They actually dropped it from the trust store. They went in and modified your OS, if you ran the, uh, I forget what it's called, but their, their bundled version of the antivirus, and pulled it out. 
<laughs> they reach into the computer and yank the software out at the OS level. That's, that's not optimal. And this wasn't, by the way, just one or two cheap laptops. This is the list. I mean, th there were a lot of machines affected. And I will guarantee you these things will be in the supply chain for two, three, five years. They'll keep showing up on eBay. And, you know, it, this was a fundamental violation. And I, I'm still just, you know, gobsmacked that it happened. But trust is complicated, right? So um, I think people have followed uh, some of the, the issues around the export control on, on, uh, on ciphers. The Bureau of Industry and Security is the government's official arm that does, uh, <coughs> that sort of considers applications for export control. So if you write software in the US, there were a lot of really ha heavy handed policies in the, in the late 80s and 90s that limited what you could do out of the country. So if you look at the, the core contributors to most of the open source crypto pieces, they weren't US nationals. Um, and a lot of people were like, oh, you know, we've, we've reformed, we, we've sort of updated a lot of that. We haven't actually, in, in fact, dealt with the long-term ramifications of that. We haven't dealt with the fact that cipher equals null is still legitimate on like 3% of all public websites. What? What? Um, we haven't dealt with the fact that 40-bit, which is now, you know, on an Amazon GPU can be, you know, cracked in a few hours, uh, worst case is still in a ridiculous number of machines uh, out there. But so the government's <laughs> agency for encryption policy doesn't have a valid cert. Oh, OK. So if we look closer, it's not even close. It's, it's not even close. And then some of these things aren't helping when you know, the director of the NSA says, I don't want back doors, I want front doors with big locks, big multiple locks. See, the problem is we had locks that were sort of this political compromise in the 90s, and it's 2015 and we're still feeling the implications of that in things like LogJam. We're still spending hundreds of millions of dollars globally to, to sort of clean up the long-term effect of that through things like uh, the downgrade attacks through things like, you know, uh, Poodle and, and the RC4 deprecation. So, you know, there's a lot that's, that's broken, but we're working on it. So what are we doing specifically? Well, one of the things that we're working on uh, at the Open Crypto Auto Project is OpenSSL. I think everybody probably knows what that is, but just um, in case you're not familiar with the scope, it runs on 80 different hardware platforms, 80. I can't even name 80 chips. Um, the byte order, big Indian, little Indian, which is most significantly significant, it flips even on non, uh, you know, 8-bit aligned platforms, OpenSSL runs. So this was a, a project commissioned by the Linux Foundation's Core Infrastructure Initiative. Like I said, it's a really ambitious scope. Um, they want an independent review. Um, if you've seen our board of advisors, you know we're, we're a motley lot and uh, not terribly beholden to any particular corporate interests. Um, we do coordinate closely with the OpenSSL team. We started the project, I think, around July of last year, but we put a, a stop to it. Um, and this hasn't gotten a lot of publicity, but OpenSSL is getting a complete rewrite. Um, I think people followed some of the stuff with LibreSSL and the OpenBSD's work, and they did and are, continue to do amazing work on that, on that side. But, you know, I, I don't know that Libre SSL is going to have the kind of penetration into, um, like, the embedded world and the device world and the, you know, home routers and cable modems and things like that that open SSL will. I could be proven wrong, but I, I think there's an enormous amount of gravity in the um, existing install base. Um, as I said, runs on every OS under the sun. Uh, every you know hardware platform you can imagine, and then of course there's the the FIPS module, which is um, if you deal with um, federal systems in the U.S., you have there's a process by which uh, if you adopt a certain technology that claims to have strong encryption, um, it ha the particular implementation has to have been uh, sort of reviewed by one of the National Institute of Standard Technologies, uh, you know, accredited partners. 
what a lot of people translate that to is, well, I bought a Blinky box, it's FIP certified, I bought some software, it's FIP certified, and so we're secure. It has nothing to do with security. It has to do with, was the math implementation correct? Um, and there's, I don't have it here, but there's a, a, a pretty sizable graveyard of, you know, FIP software and hardware that was uh, completely owned. Um, so what, what are we actually doing? So we're doing a thorough public uh, security analysis. Um, we're trying to also look at the viability of a, a reusable open source uh, framework. And what does it mean exactly? Well, um, I'll show you in just a second. So one of the biggest surprises to me with OpenSSL was how hand-tuned it is. I mean, I think it's people generally know that, like, you know, uh, I don't want to say legacy systems, but, but mature systems, sometimes you look at things that are there and you're like, there has to be a story behind this section of code I'm looking at. There had to be like a really crazy story behind this, you know, section of code. Um, there's an incredible amount of hand-tuned assembler, but strictly speaking, it's not assembler, it's Perl. So there's actually about 135,000 lines of Perl, which generates assembler in OpenSSL for different platforms. The existing static analysis tools that we have can't touch that. I mean, they can, and they might find you know a few useful things, but but in terms of the broader scope of you know execution paths and potentials, no way. So it's a monster package. Um, it's on a lot of these different platforms, um, and it's also in flux. So. <coughs> The actual state machine, the TLS state machine, is being rewritten. That's a big deal. Um, uh, the EVP module, which does uh, public key infrastructure constructions, uh, which uh, sort of encapsulates the um, uh, the hashing functions in the uh, HMAX, that does envelope encryption for multi-key. That piece is being rewritten to um, mainly to be main uh, to. Um, uh, streamline, but also for uh, memory management. The core crypto, uh, you know, SHA-2, RSA, the Diffie-Hellman, uh, the ephemeral uh, keys, the GCM, the AEA, the authenticated uh, ciphers are also going to be looked at, but they're looking at later. We worked with some folks uh, and came up with 93 million certificates uh, collected around the world. Uh, and we're also adding into that, so those were real world certificates, most of them are okay, some of them are pretty broken in weird ways, um, but we're doing this Frankincert fuzzing. So if you've looked at, um, you know, if you've, you've clicked on the, the, the box on browsers, you know that there's uh, these hierarchies. Um, and so what a lot of people look at is, okay, is the, is the RSA modulus length 1024? Is it actually 1024? Is it 2048? But what less have looked at is, these intermediary trusts. I think there's something like 6,000 uh, by transitive trust root authorities in IE and Firefox. Think about that. There's 5,900 trusted root, uh, excuse me, uh, certificate authorities. Um, <coughs> so the, 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 the data structures, the standards, ASN and 509, you know, that allow you to share um, and interoperate these certificates is a really complicated piece of code, but it's also very stable. Um, and there's actually been surprisingly few exploits in the last uh, three years in it. Um, Big num we're looking at originally too, you know, in the first phase as well. This is, you know, if if you do any work in in C or C plus plus, you know, it's pretty straightforward to declare something as, you know, an int or long. But then, you know, when you're getting into these uh, you know, these giant prime numbers, um, it, it's a whole different category that they're not first-class citizens in most languages and certainly not in C. Um, that said, things like the way that um, the way that lookups are done, the timing attack mitigations, those are actually pretty mature and, and fairly, you know, unchanging uh, in the blinding mechanisms. So anyway, we're sort of splitting it into two pieces, but the second half, is um, probably going to take the better part of the summer. Our high priority is on major architecture. So, you know, sorry if you're running, uh, you know, some 
ancient version of VAX or something, we're just not going to look at that. I mean, we're going to look at risk. We're going to look at x86. Um, we'll look at other areas um, potentially, but there's so many uh, weird uh, sort of target paths that can be, um, you know, that can be coordinated. It, it makes sense, I think, to focus on. You know, what are people running on the laptops? What are we running public-facing uh, you know, websites? What are we running on our mobiles? Uh, we're also looking at the modern protocols and primitives. So SSL is just out. Um, I mean, SSL 3 and therefore SSL has been completely deprecated. So we're not looking at that. These are, these are HTTP 2.0. And, uh, and prior to that, you know, what do you actually run in current versions of IE? Um, you know, Firefox, Chrome, et cetera. What do those uh, cipher suites look like? If you've got a, a nine-year-old, you know, Nokia candy bar phone uh, and it's on WAP uh, and your still runs RC4, you know, we're probably going to give that less attention. Um, the implementation of AES, and by that I mean the actual math, the, the finite field tables, the matrix transformation, et cetera, <laughs> It's not appropriate to have a professional services group, uh, security engineers look at that. I mean, presumably those are reasonable and known and almost unchanging. Um, but it's just, it's a different skill set. So we're, we're considering actually a third phase, which is a formal academic analysis to look at those. But that's the actual math of how AES works, not the, not the memory implementations and these other things. Um, so that's, that's where we spend a lot of time. Um, there's some, some other good news, some other things that folks are working on that's probably worth a, a mention. I think people may be aware of the TLS standard, the new 1.3 was uh, ratified in, uh, or was put for draft in, uh, I think, December, and it's, um, it's, uh, it's hit sort of formal RF, RFC now. Um, that's already making its way into the major browsers. It's already making its way into the major uh, IP sex acts. Uh, Libsodium. Um, is uh, is an attempt to do something kind of like OpenSSL, except not worrying about the, the public key, private key pieces, just mainly the, the core primitives, um, the key exchanges, um, and you know, the, the ciphers themselves. Um, if we found a flaw in AES, like a fundamental flaw, um, that's, you know, that's cryptocopolis, cryptocopolis, or however you say it. All right. So um, there aren't a lot of other well-supported or really well-understood um, sort of plan Bs. And so we're looking at ChaCha20 and, and Poly1305. Um, they're not in OpenSSL mainstream yet, but they're coming. Uh, some of Marley Mox, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike's work on the uh, off-the-record uh, protocol and the work that they're doing with uh, Whisper Systems is incredible, and I really encourage people to look at it. Um, one of the things I discovered the other day is that, um, you know, one of these emerging languages, not emerging in the sense that it's new, but emerging in the sense that it's getting more, you know, attention and, and adoption, uh, which is called Go, has OTR actually built in to the standard library. It actually also has SSH server and client built into this, the, the, the standard Go library, which is sort of incredible. Um, Containers. So I don't know if folks have uh, have looked very closely at things like Docker or Rocket or the Linux uh, containers. Um, I didn't quite, I couldn't quite get my head around this for a while, but it, it's. I really encourage you guys to to, to take a closer look because I think you're going to be hearing more about it. The idea is that um, first we go towards a really, really, really small OS footprint. Um, and then as these things are run in protected namespaces, um, you can do things like uh, Nginx or Apache. And if you list the processes, there's not like 70 processes that are typically running in, a, in an OS. There's like four. So if, if you break out of that, there's not, it's, if you know, it's sort of like change root on steroids, if you will. But if you, um, I, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more scrutiny on uh, the security model and the, potential promises of, uh, of Docker and Rocket. Uh, let's encrypt, so I think maybe some people are aware of this. This is a, it's a nonprofit started I think about a year ago or so. 
Um, these are some of the founders, but there's other folks involved now. And the idea is that if you're doing domain certificate uh, validation, so, so just, you know, do you own a domain and do you, you know, a basic uh, TLS or SSL cert, um, it, it, technically that's a trivial process. So if you've ever actually thought about the certificate authority whole ecosystem, people s sometimes spend thousands of dollars for basically a small text file, right? But what they're spending thousands of dollars presumably is on, you know, the organizational validation where you have to, you know, have a human being look at it and say, you know, the, the, we've looked at legal papers, we've looked at, you know, physical uh, presence, uh, other things, um, but that's not how the vast majority of SSL certs work on the web. Uh, the vast majority are just domain validation. Yes, I own it, and, and you're attesting to that. So the Let's Encrypt is basically, uh, the, the goal is sort of a, a command line version that says, uh, you know, I, I own foo.org, give me a cert, and you get it back in, in basically a glorified curl call. And, and, and it's non there's no cost, which is, you know, pretty amazing. Um, I think they've just announced their, uh, their CA has been, um, you know, past the first uh, couple of levels of inspection. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw the news, I think it was yesterday, the day before, um, the Office of Management and Budget um, issued uh, a directive, this is from the White House, all federal websites and services are going HTTPS only uh, by the end of next year, all of them. So I think we're going to look back in a few years and see that this is, you know, that was a major, not a magic bullet, but an important milestone in, in the history of the web. There are some cool things happening with uh, these open threat feeds. Uh, so things that are like, um, typically in the banking world and uh, in some of the higher end enterprise spaces, uh, you know, organizations would subscribe to these um, real-time threat feeds and basically feed into their IDS or feed it into their uh, firewall. But there's, there's this movement towards um, uh, kind of standardizing that, those data structures and, and you know, making that available to a wider audience. I think that's going to be a, uh, a major advance uh, for public-facing uh, sites. Uh, I mentioned before the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. It's a fantastic uh, document, and I really encourage folks to look at it. Uh, you know, one of the stats that came out was that uh, last year, 99.9% .9 uh, of exploits that were, you know, that were deconstructed had, a, you know, were taking advantage of a vulnerability that's more than a year old. These are largely public-facing, uh, you know, intrusions. That's kind of staggering. Um, but I think, I think by by putting these numbers out, I think by sharing these these sorts of uh, uh, you know, post mortems. I think, I think we're going to benefit uh, collectively for that. Um, on the threat model, some of the things that uh, we see in the news with, uh, you know, like the Anthem breach and things. I can't tell you how many CIOs or, or pundits were quoted as saying, "Well, if only they had, you know, database encryption, the hackers couldn't have gotten X." What, what does that even mean? If you if you're able to compromise all the way to DBA privileges on the machine, then either your database is shut down and you're talking about an archive, which, okay, but if you're talking about an open running database, there are very few technologies. I mean, I, I know a few through Oracle that can try to, you know, split permissions and things from administration DBAs versus application DBAs and, and those, but, 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 but really, that's just a misunderstood threat model. An encrypted database is one that's shut down. A running database is unencrypted, right? An encrypted disk is one that's shut down. When you're running it, it's not encrypted. So I think, I think we need to collectively get more nuanced about, you know, what our threat models is and are and what we're, you know, what our approach to that is. Um, and finally, you know, we're in the golden age of web security. It can be a little disheartening, I think, sometimes to see the the the, the scope of breaches that are happening out there. Um, but there are some really, really talented engineers at some of the top tech companies around the world that are working on things from the fundamentals of the stack all the way up through um, through the certificate trust chain. And I think that's a, a crucial and important part of our kind of growing pains as we go. So. I'll leave you with this. Security trust game is broken, but we are working on it.
Be careful out there, people. All right. And here's some context uh, again, if uh, if you'd like it. All right. Thank you.